For today, we'll talk about um, the potential uses of um, mapping uh, in our research uh, related to an armed civilian protection. Uh, specifically for this uh, session, we'll talk about an open source digital mapping software. I know it sounds like very technical, um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it and uh, we'll, we'll briefly kind of go through um, some of the uses and potential um, implications for our research. And I'll do, um, I'll do a quick um, outline for our presentation. So I um, prepared uh, three parts for our um, conversation this morning, today. Um, first, we'll talk about maps, mapping, and UCP, why geography matters. Um, so we'll talk about uh, what, um, what does attention to geography or attention to space uh, bring about in our research uh, to better understand uh, unarmed civilian protection. Um, second, we'll, we'll talk about uh, GIS or Geographic Information System. So this is the, the, the name uh, referring to um, the computer application uh, where we perform or conduct spatial analysis. And then uh, the last section is really more of a conversation. So um, I wanted to, uh, to, to kind of open up the, the, the conversation into really exploring what kinds of research questions related to UCP can we can we ask um, and can we answer uh, with mapping or GIS? So why maps mapping and UCP? So why geography matters? So I think um, many of us are already familiar that um, there have been a couple of um, innovations and interventions related to peace and conflict studies, um, to specifically uh, studies around armed conflict in the world, uh, where um, different organizations and, and university or institutions have been creating um, conflict maps, uh, hotspots, and dashboards. So two of the more um, popular examples here is the UCDP or the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. And a more recent one is called the Armed Conflict Location um, and Event Data Project. So I'm just going to quickly um, show everybody the uh, the dashboards for these two projects and later on i'll send uh chan chai a list of the links so you don't have to like you know copy the link here i'll send chan chai the link and you can um visit the websites on your own later on so this is the Uppsala data conflict conflict data program um, hosted by the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala. And here you can actually see um, different um, spatial data, specifically um, different countries organized into countries. And when you click them, uh, you can actually go into their um, uh, 2019 data. And it, when, when it loads, um, you can see the, um, the geographies of um, armed conflicts um, and number of deaths specifically uh, uh, and organized around state-based violence, non-state violence, one-sided violence. And so this particular dashboard or this particular um, uh, website uh, provides us the, the number of uh, casualties uh, organized around these categories. And um, if you click, say, um, Philippines, uh, it can disaggregate the data, say like in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. If you go in Mindanao, um, you can even click uh, further detail and it will show you some um, basic information on the actor um, and what kind of violence, uh, when, how many fatalities, um, and specific location um, if the data are available. So this is just an overview of that um, particular of this particular um, resource, and then the other um, the other resource is called the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. So if we look into this website, so I like their um, their tagline here: "Bring Clarity to Crisis." Um, so yeah, so this this website provides us again another um, dashboard and. Um, it organizes its data uh, based on event date, event type, region, fatalities, um, actor type, and interaction. And if you um, if you click on the drop down menu, you can actually uh, filter some of the information. If you just want to say choose a particular region here, 
um, say South America, you can, you can choose a particular country, etc. So you can um, uh, perform different kind of filters uh, in order to uh, access the information that they have here. Great. So um, why does geography matter in, a, in our research? Um, you know, we, we know that um, stuff happens anywhere, right? So there's, there's a particular setting uh, where things happen, uh, whether it's social or ecological phenomena. Um, so for, for our research specifically to, uh, about UCP, um, many of the dashboards and hotspots and conflict mapping that are happening are really focused on violence against civilians, uh, which is an important resource for our projects or our research. But there's really like a gap here in terms of how do we map um, efforts uh, that promote an armed civilian protection. So that we haven't seen yet. Um, so there's really an opportunity here to actually build upon the existing mapping projects that say like these two institutions are doing and other, um, uh, other organizations are doing in mapping cases of armed violence or in mapping cases of violence against civilians. Um, for our research, because we are interested in understanding um, an armed civilian protection and the different variables that promote and facilitate an armed civilian protection, we can definitely um, uh, start thinking about how to map um, efforts and practices um, of, uh, of an armed civilian protection in areas that we are working on. I'm going to briefly just uh, describe the, both the theoretical and empirical context of, um, of mapping and UCP. So within the scholarly literature in, in specifically in researching um, armed conflicts and violence against civilians, um, there, is, uh, there are two specific um, uh, uh, field of uh, studies that we can engage with in terms of uh, understanding the significance of mapping uh, in relation to unarmed civilian protection. So the first one is within geography, within human geography, there is a subfield called peace geographies that basically looks looks into the uneven geographies of um, of uh, armed conflicts and violence, but also of peace practices, meaning that uh, peace is really viewed as place-specific processes. And therefore, there is um, a need to really pay attention to the specific dimensions of the place or the area or the village that we are understanding um, in relation to violence and arm, an armed civilian protection. So the, um, the attention to the uneven geographies um, and 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 uh, conducting mapping really allows us to to pay attention to specific places where violence and unarmed civilian protection are happening. Um, the second set of lit literature is really uh, focused within um, the spatial turn in peace and conflict uh, research. So here, um, many peace scholars are attending to space or paying attention to space and how um, space and an armed civilian protection or space and peace building actually interact, each other, interact with each other um, in promoting civilian protection. So again, like um, these two sets of uh, literature or scholarly research can, um, can help us um, kind of like lay the grounds or like situate our research uh, in mapping and armed civilian protection. In terms of methods, so there's a range of methods that we can use in um, understanding the geographies of unarmed civilian protection uh, and in understanding, say, like the, the place-specific processes related to unarmed civilian protection. So number one is GIS analysis, which we'll talk about today. Um, so this is the use of uh, geographic information systems a type of information technology that we can use to map um, violence, but also practices uh, that promote an armed civilian protection. The other uh, methods that uh, people probably are more familiar with are uh, include participatory mapping. So this may be uh, using technology or even hand-drawn maps that we um, we organize with our, uh, say, like grassroots interlocutors or uh, research participants, and we can um, have them, uh, we can facilitate a session where we can have them draw um, specific dimensions or aspects of their village or their communities that uh, were cases of violence, but also potentials for an armed civilian protection are happening. 
Um, there's also um, a methodology and a particular scholarly field called critical cartography that specifically look into, looks into mapping in relation to um, uh, more kind of um, emancipatory and social justice and um, I guess like engagement with relations of power. Right, like looking into how mapping as a process itself can empower um, um, local agency, can empower a grassroots agency. Then the last uh, method that I want to highlight here is called spatial ethnography, and we're probably more familiar with ethnography as an anthropological or research method uh, that includes um, participant observation or, or immersion, um, description of the scene, description of what's happening, and uh, with spatial ethnography is very similar, um, but there is more attention to, again, interactions between people and space or places. Um, I'm going to highlight some examples here with the uh, spatial ethnography. So one is um, hosted at the University of Southern California called Spatial Analysis Lab. And uh, in this website, in this project, uh, they have different examples here of more like creative spatial ethnographic maps. So cinematic maps, um, space-time map, ghost map, text map, narrative maps, et cetera. So you can, um, you can go say like click on some of these examples. And here we can see this is a project by um, Professor Annette Kim at USC. And in, in, this is in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And here, uh, Professor Kim actually integrates photos, integrates um, illustrations, integrates narratives um, to, to tell a story uh, uh, that are specific to specific, uh, to specific to places, right? So this is one way of doing mapping uh, through spatial ethnography. Um, related to our research uh, on UCP. The other um, project that many of you are probably familiar with is really tracking down and tracing the uh, indigenous lands around the world. So this is native land. Uh, this is the website of native land. And here, this is more of like a historical um, uh, research, but also contemporary historic and native lands. Um, so here we can see the different native lands um, superimposed. Uh, on what we are more familiar with, the more kind of um, Westphalian kind of territorial uh, nation state maps here. Um, so here we can actually explore these websites and see um, how the native land uh, boundaries and territories uh, are overlaid within the current uh, nation states. The last example that I'm gonna highlight here is called um, thick mapping and very similar to um, slab, uh, Thick Mapping is a project uh, hosted at um, UCLA where um, mappers and, and scholars, um, both coming from the geospatial sciences and humanities, are doing different kinds of mapping um, using, say, like um, Twitter data and other information. Um, you can see here, so this is mapping Twitter in real time. Uh, and so you can just like say, um, Thailand, it's not um, yielding a, a, a result here, but, um, but we can explore this later on and, and see um, the different projects that they're working on. So um, something to think about here as we uh, continue our conversation today about GIS and mapping uh, related to UCP is like, what are the implications to our uh, UCP research and to also to our practices, right? I'm sure uh, many of you who are involved in, uh, uh, in UCP programs uh, on the ground, uh, pay attention to places, right? Pay attention to location. And um, something to think about is like, how can we use mapping as a practice in actually facilitating and promoting UCP on the ground? So the other, um, uh, thing here that I want to highlight is really the importance of geographic thinking, right? So I guess um, what I'm trying to say here is that when we um, when we are talking about mapping, what we what we are really attending to is really um, attention to geography, right? And when we uh, map, um, it helps us answer five types of geographic questions and and promote geographic thinking. So the first question is really location, right? Like where where is it happening? Where are, the, where are the cases of violence? Where are the cases of unarmed civilian protection practices? Um, where are the potential areas of unarmed civilian protection, right? Um, the second uh, set of questions is really geographic distribution. Um, how, are, how are 
the cases of violence distributed? What are the patterns and variations uh, within, say, like one country within one city? So again, like um, what we wanted to um, get out or reveal here is really the unevenness of the geographies of cases of violence, but also cases of an armed civilian protection. The third is geographic association. Um, dependencies, we're looking at dependencies. So how is um, school buildings, you know, what is the relationship between a school building and say like cases of violence or an armed civilian protection? Or what are the, what are the relationships between um, road networks and an armed civilian protection, right? So by mapping this kind of, by mapping this uh, variables, we can better understand the different um, geographic association. Um, the fourth one is geographic interaction. How do they interact, right? Like um, in terms of say um, businesses, road networks, um, mining projects. Uh, what is the relationship of say like mining projects with civil, uh, violence against civilians or an armed civilian protection. And then the last is really geographic change. How can we track changes over time? So by mapping, say like 2018 to 2021, we can actually easily detect um, changes over time. So for discussion, what are some implications of geographic thinking to our respective UCP research and practices? So I actually want to throw this out, um, this question out um, for us today. So I want us to, um, uh, at the back of our heads kind of put this question what are the implications of geographic thinking to our own respect uh, to our own ucp research and practice and then we'll get back to this later on we're going to our second uh section in this presentation so we'll talk about gis and i'll do a quick demonstration uh as well and also provide some examples and how we can use um gis in in mapping ucp so uh, briefly, GIS, um, I know it sounds very technical, Geographic Information Systems is a type of information technology that integrates data and information from various sources as maps. So the key word here is that it integrates different data, both uh, social or human data and also environmental or ecological data, and integrate this data and create maps. Um, and when we integrate different types of spatial data and other information, undetected trends and relationships between social, spatial, and temporal phenomena often get revealed to us. Again, sounds very um, technical, but what we are trying to say here is that if we um, say like combine data, for example, cities and road networks, public schools or elementary schools, churches, uh, police stations, hospitals, um, military um, uh, headquarters, uh, hotspots of violence, and, and then uh, we can uh, better visualize or better capture the geography of violence and also, uh, also better uh, visualize uh, where um, an armed civilian protection can actually happen or are happening, right? So it is through this integration and mapping that the question of where has taken a new meaning. So the reason why um, GIS and mapping, specifically in conflict mapping, is really um, get, getting um, attention is because um, we're not only locating where cases of violence are happening, but actually it provides us uh, a, a better understanding of why um, cases of violence are happening in those locations. And it allows us to understand and investigate further um, the different kind of social, environmental, or cultural, political, economic kind of information that influence those, um, those locations, right? Okay, so um, for today, we will um, briefly go through uh, and, and demonstrate and look into a particular open source desktop GIS software called KeyGIS. So it's open source because it's for free and it's open source because developers actually contribute to uh, further improving the software. So because it's free, you can download and install this in your desktop and you can load and integrate different data. So there are two different types of data. Very briefly, I'm just gonna talk to mention them. Uh, we have what we call vector. These are like the points, lines, and polygons that you probably have seen many times in, 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 different, uh, in different digital maps, uh, especially around the time of COVID. Um, and then there's also the raster data, which is um, working with satellite imagery to look into elevation or terrain analysis, et cetera. Uh, once we've uh, installed GIS, we can actually perform spatial analysis. And these are some of the more methods that we use in GIS. Um, they may sound a little bit technical, but 
we can learn this later on. So geocoding, basically assigning latitude and longitude to specific uh, phenomena so we can map them. Um, actually, we can do this manually as well because uh, Google Maps provide us the specific latitude and longitude. And there are also digital services where we can, uh, if we're working with big data, like thousands of data, street addresses, we can actually um, upload those street addresses and, and have, like, have them geocoded, meaning, assigned a latitude and longitude to them. We can make choropleth maps. These are basically um, the maps that we've seen uh, with COVID, like different shades of colors, the diverging color pattern, and the diverging color scheme, where the darker color refers to more cases of COVID, the lighter is less. So these are what we call choropleth maps. And we can make these maps to understand, say, like violence and also an armed civilian protection. We can also do spatial buffering, meaning we can perform, say, like in a one mile radius, how many villages or civilians or, or houses or households will be affected by violence, et cetera. And then we can do terrain and elevation analysis. So these are some of the spatial analysis that we can perform in GIS. And then we can also create maps. So I'm going to um, give us an example of how do we integrate data as maps. So what, 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 what am I talking about here? So I've highlighted here three, um, three different open source data that we can actually maximize and use as references. So the, uh, again, like the Uppsala conflict data uh, program provides us um, open source data as well. So if we look into this website, it will actually give us all this information. So here we can download, say, like um, non-state conflict issues and actors data set. And if you click this, it will give you a spreadsheet with um, geolocated data uh, where non-state conflicts are happening. It will also um, give you other information that their research team has provided. Uh, you can also look into the peace agreement data set. We can map out where peace agreements are happening. Uh, we can look into battle-related deaths. If we're interested in understanding where um, civilian deaths are happening, uh, then we can download this data set. And again, they are geolocated and we can work with this data in our QGIS and map this information. The other source of um, data is also from ACLED or ACLED. Um, this is again, like the armed conflict um, location and event data project. And they've actually um, organized their data set based on uh, world regions. So in Africa, you can download the file. And again, it will give you, it won't give you a map. When you download it, it will give you a spreadsheet. Uh, and this spreadsheet is basically the data that they prepared that we can actually work, uh, use in our, in our mapping um, activity or research. So these are some of the data that we, they have here, uh, but there's, there's many more. And this website, uh, Diva GIS, is actually um, run by a professor at the University of California in Davis. And here we can actually get the different um, spatial data that we need in order to map, um, say, like boundaries of countries, cities, um, some climate data, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just so many data available for us to work with that are open source and, and also reliable. Um, on top of that, once we've integrated all this, you can also integrate other data that you collect uh, with your research team. For instance, if you go out doing interviews and do some or participant observation, uh, you can uh, record some of your interview data and you can identify where um, the locations of the events or issues that your interviewee are describing to you, and you can geolocate them, right, by getting the latitude and longitude, and then also map that in addition to everything that we have here um, from these different resources. Okay, so I'm going to just quickly um, give some examples here from the data set. So this is um, a data set that I downloaded from the ACLED website, and this is the violence against civilians in Southeast Asia between 2018 to 2021. So in a three-year period, we can actually map out um, the, the cases of violence against civilians. So as you can see, this is um, Southeast Asia, and we can see visually, right, we can easily uh, visualize where many cases uh, of violence against civilians are happening. So in Myanmar, specifically in the last three years in the Philippines, right, but also spread out throughout Southeast Asia. But again, by mapping um, cases of civilians against um, 
cases of violence against civilians, again, we can see first the uneven geographies of it, right? Um, it's not the same any, everywhere. But at the same time, it provides us um, a prompt, right? Like it gives us a prompt. It's like, oh, why is it? Um, why are there so many cases in the Philippines across the country? Why are there so many cases in Myanmar? Um, there are cases in Thailand, but around the border areas, right, etc. So again, like it provides us a better kind of understanding of the geography of the violence, and also prompt us to say like ask geographic questions related to UCP. Using the same data, I also map out the violence against civilians in Myanmar in the same three year period. And here I aggregated or I, I uh, selected the specific actors. So using different color scheme, we can actually identify the different actors who are um, allegedly perpetrating the violence against civilians in Myanmar. So here we can see a list of the different actors here. Um, and where they are located uh, around the country. I also uh, integrated, say, like the city, so we can actually see the relationship between say, like, cities or provincial capital with, say, like cases of violence. Um, this is a, a map of um, violence against civilians by the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the rebel group called New People's Army in the Philippines between 2018 and 2021. So I've mapped out here um, the cases of violence against civilians uh, perpetrated by the military and perpetrated by the NPA. And we can see here, uh, again, like the clustering, right, in Mindanao, in the Visayas area, parts of Luzon. Um, there seems to be, again, like interactions between um, the two actors here, but there are also places where in there are more isolated um, violence against civilians, meaning like only perpetrated by one particular actor. I also integrated uh, primary roads and the barangays or the villages, so we can actually see where um, some of these cases are happening. So what if we integrate anti-drag vigilante violence against civilians? So here we um, actually are working with different data now. We're, we're working with these, these two data and also integrating additional set of data, um, uh, violence against civilians um, that, are, uh, that happened related to or, or perpetrated by anti-drag anti vigilantes. So here we can see, um, again, like the, the different geographies of the three different um, actors, right? And, and from this, we can actually um, make our own, make our analysis and, and or, or create further research questions and investigate, right? Why are they happening there and not here, et cetera, et cetera. And how can we protect civilians in this particular places, right? Um, the last example that I'm going to provide here is this is um, I'm integrating elevation data here. Uh, this is Luzon in northern part of the Philippines. So the the, the red uh, shades here uh, refer to higher elevation, and the green um, are lower ele elevation. And I wanted to see if um, what what we can find out uh, in terms of the relationship between elevation and say like. Um, violence against civilians perpetrated by anti-drag vigilantes. And so here we can see um, a lot of these cases are happening mostly in lower lowland areas, right? So we can see here, um, there are some cases in like upland areas, but really very few, at least in this particular period. But here we can see that they're happening mostly in lowland areas. So again, like this is another way to visualize the geography of violence against civilians and prompt us to understand um, or investigate how can we uh, perform UCP research or implement UCP practices. Um, so that is the desktop GIS, but there's also a different um, format where we can perform mapping, and one is called web-based web -based mapping. So the, the examples that I provided earlier are all web-based mapping. And here I'm showing you an example actually from our colleague from Colombia, uh, Laura, who created um, a digital map, right? Like a web-based map that maps out the different um, high, um, environmental uh, kind of like resource projects or extraction projects like hydroelectric um, and other kind of uh, projects here. So they've geolocated particular projects. And then when you click them, you can actually see the different types of project and where they are. So this is a good uh, example of web-based mapping. And again, we can integrate more data here in terms of where are the cases of violence happening and how they are clustered uh, within, near, or away from this um, 
uh, extractive projects, right? And then where, where can we actually visualize an armed civilian protection or where can we actually find UCP practices? Um, other examples here that we can use for our web-based mapping are, are, are called ArcGIS story maps. I'm sure many of you are familiar with story maps. They integrate, uh, story maps allow us to integrate photos with text and, and spatial data. You can only use Carto and Mapbox. These are more like um, uh, a little bit more kind of on the programming side, but these are some examples of the web-based mapping. So I'm going to um, stop here a little bit and actually um, demonstrate some exa an example of how we can use QGIS. So this is QGIS and um, I've already preloaded some of the spatial data here. So we have um, the world regions and countries, right? So we can see here um, a different, uh, like um, the world map basically, right? And if we focus say like in Colombia, um, because I know where Colombia is, so I'm just going to focus there. Um, and if we add the, say like the data um, from ACLED, uh, actually I, I want to show you the, the whole world for a minute. So these are the, these are the world data um, around the world. So if we look into this, because we're working with a lot of data, it will take us a while to process them, but um, there you go. So, okay, so we've loaded um, between 2018 and 2021. These are all the cases of violence against civilians around the world from collected by the ACLED project. So uh, what's very interesting here is that when we actually open the attribute table, as we call it in GIS, um, we can actually see the data set and the information that ACLED has gathered. Um, and we can actually use this information when we do our research. So um, again, because it's a big data, um, uh, there are a lot of um, information. So it's going to take a little bit, a uh, few minutes to, to load this, but I wanted to show it to you so you can actually have a better understanding of what information we can have we can use in our in our research here. So these are the data between 2018 and 2021. Um, it organizes into different types. So there are protests, battles, other violence against civilians, etc. cetera. Um, sub event type, they've organized this already. Um, actors are laid out, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we can, uh, we can actually use this information, very um, rich information, um, to actually understand or start investigating where UCP are happening or can potentially happen, right? So um, I want to actually uh, say like, I want to just focus say like in one country. So I wanted to do Colombia and I'm going to just like say, um, filter out um, one country here. Maybe this is too much to actually perform, um, but I'm just going to zoom in in one country, for instance, and we can hear, we can see here like Colombia and, and by actually zooming in or like filtering particular sets of um, information on one particular country, say in Colombia, we can actually see the different cases here and then perform our analysis as to, do we want to map out um, violence against civilians that are related to protests? Do we want to map out violence against civilians related to say like um, attacks or other um, civilians perpetrated by a particular actor, right? So this is one example. And then we can, using this um, software or using this platform, we can actually create the maps that I've um, illustrated or showed um, earlier in our presentation. Great, so um, there's just like last two things that I wanna say and then we can like start our conversation. Um, as with any other research activity, um, GIS is bound by a particular set of ethics and uh, we have a GIS code of ethics here. Um, uh, and I can provide more information about this later on. But what I want us to think about is and, and reflect is really what is the impact of GIS in our research, right? So, so one is really giving us the ability and opportunity to create cutting edge research, meaning that research that hasn't been done, uh, research that provides new information, specifically with regards to integrating geographic and human data. Uh, we can also um, visualize uh, 
different kind of research activities using mapping that promote critical and participatory research methods. And then also for our organizations and research team, and also for um, civilian community members, this, help us, this helps us actually uh, promote um, skills capacity building, skills training, uh, professional development, right? Because it gives us new skills uh, that we can actually offer to our uh, research uh, team, research inter uh, participants, and also community members. So the last um, thing that I want us to think about is really what kinds of research questions do you, do you think we can answer with mapping our GIS? What are some examples of social and geographic data related to UCP in your research site that you can integrate? So with this, I'm going to end our presenta my presentation and I want to open and I'm encouraging and inviting everybody to reflect on these two set sets of questions. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you.